We've all watched videos here on YouTube. There's no shortage of information on how to take better photos. We learn things like hyperfocal distance to get sharp photos. We've learned rules of composition to make our photos look better. And we've learned how to take correct exposures. But not all of this knowledge is useful in every situation. So in this video, we're gonna go over how to separate knowledge from wisdom. Now we all know what the circular polarizer does. It can add a bit of saturation to things like leaves and woodland photography. It removes glare off of reflective surfaces like water or rocks and leaves. You're able to see under the water when you spin the polarizer and cuts the glare. It works in a lot of cases and can add contrast and interest to an image. But wisdom is knowing when not to use it. Take this image here I took in Patagonia. The light was reflecting on this river winding through the valley. It's such a strong component of the image. It's a leading line that takes the viewer's eye through the image to the mountains in the background. But what makes it a strong component is the reflection and the difference in tone that's caused by the dark shoreline. The contrast is what's drawing the eye. I was able to recognize this in the field, so I used an ND filter to increase the shutter speed and smooth out the water but not using a polarizer helped me keep that important contrast. Now, had I used the polarizer, I would have removed the contrast and that leading line would have been much less prominent and it would have been an overall weaker image. Now, here's an image where I used the circular polarizer in a similar situation and because I cut the glare, I removed the contrast, the light reflecting onto the water was creating and it weakened the image. So if you want nice strong reflections in the water, don't use a polarizer. Us landscape photographers, we love to get everything sharp. We want razor sharp photos from front to back. We learn about hyperfocal distance, where to focus to get everything sharp, what the best aperture is for the biggest depth of field. We obsess about it. We go crazy with learning how to focus stack to make sure that we got it all. But do we really need to always have everything razor sharp from front to back? Let's look at a few examples where I let parts of the image fall out of focus and it worked out much better. So let's take these two images from the same location in Death Valley. Both of these images were taken on the exact same morning, the one on the left with a wide angle lens and the one on the right with a telephoto lens. But they both share one thing in common. Both were taken with one exposure and they aren't 100% tack sharp through the entire image. And that's perfectly fine. The wide angle photo, the mountains and the moon aren't 100% sharp and they don't need to be. The moon is so small because of the wide angle lens and the mountains are soft and lack any detail anyway because of the early blue hour. They aren't the main focal point of the image. These beautiful circular patterns on the ground are what's important and they're what needs to be sharp. Now the image on the left is exactly the opposite. The foreground doesn't need to be tack sharp. It isn't important. It's the moon and the mountains that are the subject. They're sharp and that's what matters. You really have to ask yourself if going through the headache of trying to figure out the hyperfocal distance or focus stacking is even worth the time and the effort and how much it's actually gonna affect the end result. You can also take this further by using that fall off in focus as a way to create depth and separation between your subject and the background. Now I've shown this image and I've talked about this before, but it's a powerful technique. Use that wider aperture to let that background fall out of focus. Now I love some long exposure photography. Using filters to get that silky smooth water looks great and showing that relationship between what's moving and what isn't can make for impactful images. But knowing when and more importantly why you're doing this can go a long way. Here's what I mean. Let's take this image I took in Scotland. Now, there is a multitude of problems I have with this image, but one that I think is really an eyesore, aside from the composition, is the lack of detail in the water. The shutter speed is way too long. Now, I've gone ahead and named this photo, Shutter Speed's Gone Wild. I just put on any old filter that would extend the shutter without really thinking about the volume and the velocity of the waterfall. Now this shutter speed is 0.6 seconds. 
It's just long enough to lose the detail in the water. It looks like just a blob of white mess. Shorter shutter speeds look better. They have more detail and also give a little bit of a different feel. Now let's look at a photo where I took the time to think through my shutter speed. The beautiful and iconic Skogafoss in Iceland. Now that mistake I showed you guys in the last image, I've seen this so many times at this waterfall, but there is so much volume and velocity coming out of Skogafoss. So right here, my shutter speed is around 1 25th of a second. Now this shutter speed helps me almost freeze the action. There's just a slight bit of motion blur. Now this conveys the power of the waterfall. So you need to think about the situation, what you're trying to convey in your image, and when to apply that knowledge you have, and when not to apply it. Not every waterfall or seascape is going to need that one second shutter speed. Not every image needs to be tack sharp going from front to back. And you don't always need to use a circular polarizer to cut the glare. You know the what, you know the how, now you just have to start asking yourself the why and you'll be taking your photography to the next level. And if you're wanting to go from beginner to expert with your long exposure photography, click here in this video and I'll see you over there.